So good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning, what a privilege it is to gather in the Lord's name and proclaim His glory for His mercy upon our souls. And those meditating upon the Word um, and what the pastor sent out, for the verses he'll be preaching on today, this verse just struck me. The Lord said to Cain, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to master you, but you must rule over it. So Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you've sent into our lives, Lord, that that truth we just heard um, is a blessing for us. For all time, Lord, that we do make real choices. And Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells us, we can reject what is evil and choose what is good. Lord, by your strength and your might, Lord, you can empower us to defeat the sin that so easily entangles us. Lord, for this is our great enemy. And on that great day, when we stand with you, we will see, Lord, how vile, how wicked sin truly is in your sight. So, Lord, until that day, give us eyes to see the wickedness and the perverseness and the vileness of what sin really is. And, Lord, to agree with you that even the most minor transgression of sin, Lord, deserves your infinite punishment of wrath because of who you are, because of your character, because of your nature. So Lord, we come together and praise your holy name for you are holy, Lord, and you call us to be holy for without holiness no one will see the Lord. So Lord, strengthen us, Lord, to understand truly what sin is and how it so entangles our lives. Lord, give us the strength and the power, Lord, to defeat this sin. Lord, arm us with that battle armor each and every day, particularly your word, the sword of the Spirit, which can slay all this sin that so easily, we are so easily drawn into. So Lord, I pray that we all search our catalog of this week in our hearts, even right now. Lord, coming to understand that we need a Savior every day. We need your mercy, glory, and goodness upon our souls every day. And Lord, you're there. You offered yourself upon that cross for that sin. Lord, and you continually encourage us. You continually strengthen us. You continually guide us into righteousness. To do what's right before you and before our fellow men. So Lord, strengthen us and encourage us. Build us up, Lord, by the power of your word and your spirit to understand this in a deeper, profound way. I pray that the word that comes forth this morning, Lord, would change us into your image in a greater way. Lord, we have learned something about you. We have learned something about ourselves, Lord, that would guide us and help us and encourage us. So Lord, uh, glorify your name amongst your people this morning. Lord, may we all uh, praise your holy name for this mercy given to us, Lord, and the strength and the power given to us. Lord, we pray for this land. Lord, it has turned away from your word, it's turned away from your truth, turned away from your guiding principles. But Lord, stretch out your arm to save and you will save. Lord, make a people ready for your inheritance, Lord, that are obedient to your word and guided by your precepts. Lord, that stand above the wickedness and the vileness that is so part of this world this day, so much more evident. Lord, strengthen us. So, Lord, we pray for all of our elected officials at the state and the federal and the local level. Lord, for the courage and the strength and the fortitude necessary to do what's right. Lord, Despite what it looks like on the outside, Lord, you are holy. 
and your principles guide us. Lord, bless this congregation to be formed into your image. We praise you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Table together, and it is such a blessing to come together. My favorite time of the week is meeting with everyone here, enjoying the time together. As a quick order of business, I um, do want to make an apology to our church. Last Sunday, um, our sister here, Tammy, had said something that was to her heart, and I had misheard what she said and said something quite unloving. Uh, so I do ask for forgiveness for that. Um, amen. That's a, something on my heart for sure that uh, has been bothering me. Um, and brothers and sisters, I have the privilege of reading you some verses um, from Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, and Matthew 5, verses 21 through 26, concerning murder. So if you can stand for the reading of God's word. You shall not murder. Simple and sweet. I have the Exodus. <clears throat> You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, the anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that you have something against a brother or sister, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. And God bless the reading of his word to your soul. You may be seated. series of message delighting in the God of the Ten Commandments, the purpose hopefully to deepen our understanding of the commandments, to deepen our appreciation for the God <coughs> of the Ten Commandments. And this morning we're considering the Sixth Command. And the title, as you see there on the screen or in your bulletin, is The Sin of Murder as, designed, as Defined by God's Word. And the central idea is God prohibits murder. And in God's prohibition of murder, we see the command, clearly Exodus 20, 13, not to murder. That would be the letter of the law. God permits, God prohibits murder with the hand. I think it's probably safe to say that no one's committed murder. Well, I shouldn't say that. I don't know the answer to that. The command not to murder, we see that's the letter of the law, the spirit of the law. God prohibits murder in the heart. And I, I remember growing up uh, in the church that I grew up in. Um, 
And it taught you a reverence for God, and it taught you about the holiness of God. And I remember having conversations uh, with my mom about sin, and I already told you before. My mom was my biggest fan in the sense of, uh, my mom and dad both, but my mom in terms of always supporting and encouraging me and telling me how great I was, <laughs> how wonderful I was. And I really wasn't that bad of a sinner type of situation. And of course, I was her son. I remember we talk about, well, you haven't committed murder, and you haven't done certain sins, so you're good. You're fine. You're good. You'll, you'll, you'll be fine. And um, then as we grow and as the Lord saves, and when the Lord saves us, we have a different understanding of uh, the wickedness of our heart and our sin and our breaking uh, all the commandments. And so we're going to look at this in light of uh, what Jesus says. And you already kind of got an idea where it are going to end up when we talk about God prohibits murder in the heart. Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for your word, for the truth of your word, for the reality of your word. We thank you for the music, the hymns, the choruses, the singing, the Lord's table, and now the word as we continue in the spirit of worship. Move in our hearts, Lord, deepen our understanding of the God who saved us, From the law, the one who delivers us from the penalty of sin and is delivering us from its power in our life today, including the sin of anger. And we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You shall not murder. And the command not to murder, preserving human life, was uh, implied here. The prohibition, if you look in Scripture, and I have the references to this if anybody was curious, Prohibition doesn't include the killing of animals, beasts, defending one's home from intruders, to accidental killings. Doesn't even exclude the execution of murderers by the state. Doesn't include the involvement with one's country in war. Actually, I got a book on my bookshelf that I was reminded of this week by Martin Lloyd Jones. Martin Lloyd Jones that says, why does God allow war? Which would be interesting. But we have here the commandment, the principle, the command not to murder. God views life as precious because God created life, mankind, humankind, men, women, children, in his image. Genesis chapter 9, verses 4 through 6 say, says, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, with its life that is its blood. Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast. I will require it. And from every man, and from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made you. He made you. The prohibition the command not to murder, the value that God places on life, on human life, the letter of the law. God prohibits murder with the hand. Now we go to Matthew 5, 21 through 26, um, where Jesus deepens the commandment as he deepened all of these commandments. Lord willing, next week we'll see thou shalt not commit adultery. And how the Lord deepens that commandment. And how that commandment covers all sin, sexual sin. Adultery, fornication, pornography, sexual immorality, all of it. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that the ancients were told <clears throat> you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. So there's the letter of the law again. You shall not murder. And Jesus, has said, deepens this commandment as he does all the commandments. He not only forbids the outward act, but also the very thought and word that seeks to destroy a person's, a man or woman's life. Verse 22, Jesus says, But I say to you, that anyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, 
shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And Orpah says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. He says, here is the law, you shall not commit murder. Whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But he said, but I say to you. The Pharisees taught that murder consisted literally, of course, of taking one's life. Jesus said the commandment extended not only to that act itself, but also to the internal act, the eternal attitude behind the act of murder, right? The Bible says that without, within the heart comes the sin, and without, from the heart comes forth the sin, the action carried out. It comes from the heart. Murder begins with anger, bitterness, envy, jealousy. Thomas Watson has this really good book, if you wanted to read a, a good book um, on the Ten Commandments, this would be one of the two that I would recommend to you, I'm sure there's others, but Watson pointed out 12 ways that we may be said to murder, and I'm just going to list a couple of them from his book. He says, 12 ways in which we murder, with the hand, with the mind. You know, when you're replaying and you're replaying the wrong and the injustice and, the, and what is done to you. And some just live there in that trap of their, of their mind where they cannot get past maybe some really bad, serious things that were done to them. Hurts that they had at the hand of someone. And maybe, you know, someone sinned against us one time in some particular way, and we just go on and on and on, murdering them over and over and over again with our mind. Malice is mental murder. We can murder with the tongue, for sure, according to Watson, according to our own testimony, any one of us, we murder with the tongue. Back in Watson's day, with the pen, <laughs> today, that's one of the things about the social media stuff that people might say things on there that they would never say to someone uh, face to face. Um, so with the, the pen. Jesus says that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Anger. I, I, I suppose maybe it's just my own personal thought, but it's like definitely you look at the list of sins in Ephesians chapter 4, Colossians, sins that we are very much capable of committing and do commit, uh, even as believers in Christ. Anger is one of them. So I was looking up a bunch of different verses this week, and like the cord is on anger, and uh, it's all over the place, right? Anger. The word for anger in the original, he says, but who? Everyone who is angry. Okay, so we're talking about murder in the heart. We're talking about anger here uh, for a moment. The remedy for all of this is the Lord's table, in essence. The remedy for all of this is the cross of Christ. The remedy for all of this is confession and repentance and turning to Jesus to be saved. That initial turning to Jesus to be saved. Then that continual ongoing need to turn to Jesus for self, for forgiveness of our sin. Perhaps anger. Anger is that brooding, simmering anger that's nurtured and fed and not allowed to die. That's the point of it. It's not allowed to die. You see it carried out in many different ways with yourself, with people around you. There's some that are just volcanoes that explode. Uh, not periodically, like, I don't know how often a volcano explodes, but, but just are ready to explode uh, on a really regular kind of basis. There's that anger and there's that wrath. There's the other kind of anger, and I've seen it with children that have, been with, that have lived in our home, lost their kids. It's like, oh, well, they're okay. Uh, you can see the steam coming up the top of their head where they're brooding. One day just yell and scream or punch somebody in the face or lash out with their words. Another would just be solid and quiet, and you can just literally see them brooding. I remember one night in particular watching one of them brood in anger, and I didn't know what they were going to do. I remember pretty much saying, i got to stay up the whole night. Because I don't know what this person's going to do with this anger. 
anger. It's seen in holding a grudge, smoldering bitterness that refuses to forgive. God prohibits murder in the heart. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, anger in the heart toward any human being, and especially to those who belong to the household of faith, is according to our Lord something that is, something that is as reprehensible in the sight of God as murder. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, and he's talking about in the household of faith here, and that's what Lloyd-Jones is referencing. Actually, Lloyd-Jones has a great, it's his book on, oh, that's another book that I think, is it a whole book on the Ten Commandments? It's a whole book on the Sermon on the Mount by Martin Lloyd-Jones, where he deals with all these, uh, how Jesus transcends and trans, uh, deepens all these commandments. It's another good book. He says, whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing? <laughs> so just even the harsh words, even just, just right, just, we see the seriousness of unchecked, unconfessed, unrepented of anger. You good for nothing shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. You who say you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So when you're, maybe some, you know, we, everyone could deal with all, uh, uh, be affected by all these sins. There might, some of you I don't think are uh, overly angry people. Um, some of us are, or can be, we're all capable of it. But again, the remedy here is the cross. The remedy is Christ. The remedy is running to Him. The remedy is relying upon Him. The remedy is repentance. The remedy is a deepening in our relationship with Him. The remedy is don't grieve the Holy Spirit. But instead be filled with the Spirit. So, we got this prohibition, we got this prohibition of murder. The command not to murder. You got the prohibition. You got the God prohibiting murder with the hand. That's the letter of the law. You have God prohibiting murder in the heart. That's the spirit of the Lord, a law. That's where we're at right now. So, let's start thinking about how we would apply this command. Because Jesus deepens the command not to murder. Lord, help us to repent of unrighteous anger toward others. That's what's here in verse 22 of chapter 5. I say to everyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. This is uh, unrighteous anger toward others. There's a whole great study in scripture and a whole great thinking here about what is the difference between unrighteous anger and righteous anger. Righteous anger is when there's anger over the cause of God, the, the, the cause of Christ uh, to be uh, denigrated in some way. Righteous anger over things in life, things in society, things that happen. Abortion would be a good example. Righteous anger, murder. That's murder, committing murder. Ancient, righteous anger over that. Unrighteous anger is one that we deal with mostly, I think. And that's anger over what has happened to me. It is anger over something in my life that, that, that affects the idols of my heart. Uh, my self-love for myself. Uh, that's the unrighteous anger. Great illustration of that. I think we had reference to this earlier. Is in Genesis chapter 4. Please hear this. This is just so um, pertinent, right? Genesis chapter 4. First sin a murder. Cain and Abel. Jealousy. One brother toward the other. If there was any, if any of you have had children, right? More than one. <laughs> You've seen this carried out. Their jealousy toward each other. There, I want what I want, and this is mine, and I've watched them, I've, I've watched, 
I try to find our, our, our vacuuming gets done so well I can't even find like a piece of lint. I watched two children in our home literally fight to the death practically over like a piece of lint, a piece of paper, a piece of junk on the ground. And both of them saying, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. I mean, they're ready to kill each other over a piece of a piece of lint, a piece of a piece of paper, a piece of uh, 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 nothing. Or presently, I, I hear every day, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, and then they'll run and chase each other, crawl through the house, give it to me. And if they grab each other, they do. And then there's anger produced there on their part toward each other. It began here in Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel. Abel, on his part, also brought up the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain, for his offering, he had no regard. How many times have you seen in your own life or in your life of uh, people around you this next part, the next part of this verse carried out when, when this kind of situation comes to be? So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Oh, poor me. Oh, me. Oh, myself. Something got taken away from me. I am a victim. Oh, my word, I am a victim. And his countenance fell. I suppose it wouldn't be so bad if his countenance just fell or our countenance just fell and we just stopped right there. Right? The next part of the verse says, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? So there's the anger coming up. And why has your countenance falling? If you do will, well, will not your countenance be lifted up? You see that a lot of times in Scripture where it's in a lot of the Psalms where the countenance came and the spirit just becomes bowed down within one. Focuses on self. Focuses on self. Focuses on self. God says, no, if you do well, your continents will be lifted up. No, if you will lift, look up, look to me, your continents will be lifted up. But, and if you do not do well, and you're sitting there in the midst of your anger, in the midst of your brooding, in the midst of your stew, stewing, it says, sin is crouching at the door. Like the enemy, like the lion, like the devil, prowling around like a hungry lion, looking for whom he will devour. Sin is crouching. It's, it's about to get you. It's about to get a hold of you. It's about to take over you. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. See, we can master, we can, through Christ and through His Spirit indwelling us, we can, said, the Bible says, sin shall not be your master. The Bible says, don't make any provision for the flesh. Just, just, it's just where you go in your mind. I mean, it's just where you, what you start thinking about. And you get frustrated with something, or something's not going your way, and then you just, you know, you get angry. We get angry. You have to fight that. Got to get outside of ourselves and get to focus on the Lord. Cain told Abel, his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up. Too bad Cain didn't stop. Too bad Cain didn't hear what God was saying to him there and just repent, right? We wouldn't have the first murder. Cain told, his, Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. And for some, the anger in their heart for the unsaved, for the unregenerate, for the not yet believer in their in, in life and, and that's sitting here, that's hearing this or watching this, the anger is an indication that you need to be saved by Jesus Christ. You know you've carried out your anger, right? You, you, you're, you're, an ang you're angry. You've carried it out. That's an indication and a pointing to you to the cross of Jesus Christ for him to save you, for him to cleanse you. For him to deliver you from yourself, from that anger. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know where he is. Am I my brother's keeper? 
And the answer to that question is yes, we are our brother's keeper. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Let's repent of unrighteous anger toward others. God prohibits murder in the heart. Let's, percent, let's repent of hatred toward each other. Yeah, we're capable of that. Yeah, maybe sometimes it's even a momentary flash of just, I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate you. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 through 18. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 19. What did I say? 17 through 18. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. So there's that hatred that, that happens in the moment, even in the flash of anger before the wrath comes out. There's hatred in our heart toward someone. He says, you may surely reprove your neighbor, but shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Boy, that's something that we have to constantly remind ourselves. I am the Lord. And for His, we are His. He is the Lord. Lord, help me. Lord, help me to repent of unrighteous anger. Lord, help me to repent of the hatred that would rail up within my heart. Help me to see what the root cause of some of this stuff is that's coming out of my heart that's producing this wicked ungodly fruit that we as all believers in the New Testament just has put off, put off, put off, put off, he said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John verse, chapter 3, verse 15. This is just, actually we'll start with verse 11. For this is the message which you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain who was of the evil one. Oh, by the way, when there's anger, when there's hatred, when there's murder in the heart, we are behaving most like the evil one, the devil, who was a murderer, it says in the scripture, he was a murderer, hence the unsaved person, today is the day of salvation, you need to repent and turn to Jesus Christ today, to repent of all of your sin, your sin of anger, your sin of murder and be saved by Jesus Christ before you face eternal death and eternal separation from God in hell, place reserved for the devil and his angels. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and he slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we pass out of death into life. Murder is death. Pass out into pass from death into life through Jesus Christ. Because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother. Many time and times I've heard that. I hate you. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So let's repent of hatred toward one another. And if we're not saved, and if we're not yet a believer, let's turn to Jesus Christ today in repentance and faith to save us from the wickedness of our sin and the folly of our sin. This is just one sin, sin of murder, sin of anger, right? Let's repent of envy. These are all the things that lead to murder in the heart and actually also could lead to murder with the hand. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. Envy. Repent. So repent of envy. Jealousy. Galatians 5, let's start with verse 19. 
Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying. Actually, I'm saying in our application here, let's repent of envy. Let's repent of immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Again, he's writing here in Galatians to the believers in Christ. I said to somebody this week, sin in the life of the believer is talked about more in Scripture than sin in the life of the unbeliever. Sin in the life of the believer is more serious than sin in the life of the unbeliever in that sense. Sin in the life of the unbeliever, though, will lead them right to hell, which is what the next part of this verse says. If you're practicing these things, not if you fall into these things periodically, <clears throat> not if you're confessing these things, and repenting of them. Not if you hate those sins that we just I just listed. And you're and you're and you're moving and moving and moving to the Lord in confession and repentance and asking for help and reading his word and praying and seeking biblical counsel, biblical counsel and being with um, brothers and sisters in Christ and, and trying to overcome these sins. But he says, I forewarned you that those and the unbeliever practices these things. The unbeliever has no other means outside of himself but to practice these things. It says they're, pra they're not only practicing them, they're really good at them. Okay. It says, but those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's repent. Let's repent of bitterness. There we talk about hatred. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. I love this. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification with which no one will see the Lord. So really, when you look at this commandment and look at all the commandments, you look at what it says in Galatians, the list of sins that I just read there, which incidentally is just before, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, kindness. Gentleness, goodness, self-control, I might have left one out. Where was I going to go with that? I was about heading towards some place right there. Peace oh. with everyone. Okay. Sin in our life. Sin is a matter either for some, it's being sanctification, being sanctified. Without holiness, no one will come to see the Lord. Those who are believers in Christ are in that running, in that race, and being sanctified, being made more like Christ, being made holy. So that's one instance of how these sins affect people. And then the other way the sins affect people is it's just, it's just an alarm. If I could stand on the top of the building, it's just an alarm. You need to be saved, child, adult, youth. You need to be saved from your sin. It is bringing you to hell. It will bring you, it's bringing, it will bring you to hell. Actually, there's two things going on in the life of every single person sitting here today. Some are ripening for hell. Right here as they sit, right here as they listen. They're ripening for hell. What's the other part? What's the other word? Because with an R. Some are ripening for hell. Some are being renamed. Re i got to think of a better way of saying it. They're, they're not ripening for hell, but they're being changed. They're being transformed. They're, they're being made more like Christ. Romans 12. Verse 18. I love this verse too. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. <laughs> like, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Oh boy, talk about deepening it. But if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will eat burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The spirit of the law. God prohibits murder in the heart. Let's repent. Bitterness. Hatred. Let's repent of unforgiveness toward each other, which leads to anger.
Ephesians chapter 5. Rich, 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 rich. Deep and deep and deep and deep. And deep. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. 31. Colossians 13. Colossians 3, 4, 4, 31, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. There it is. Let's just back it up a little bit. <laughs> wow, I can't back it up that far. I can't back it up to Genesis. No, I can't back it up that far. Verse 30. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind and tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave you. The mountain of sin, the mountain of sin, past, present, future, sins that we have been forgiven of, as the Lord has forgiven us. Lord, help us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Help us to those that are in the very act, even today, when we leave here. Maybe someone's going to sin against us. Help us, Lord, even in that moment to forgive that person and not respond with anger, wrath, bitterness, rage. Forgive one another. Colossians 3, 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against you, against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should. Those that carry around that unforgiveness and that harbor that unforgiveness in their heart and the bitterness that's in their heart over a lot of times over past things that have happened to them. They need to repent. We need to repent of it. And for some that carry that, it's an indication that they're not the Lord's. It is. It is because if they've known the, really the kindness of God and they've really understood and recognized what happened on that cross and they really and genuinely have been converted and saved and realized and recognized the multitude of sins that they've been forgiven of, they would not, they would, they, they could not help but forgive someone else. And forgiving them doesn't mean necessarily you're forgetting it or you're just washing it away or saying that it's not, it wasn't really bad what they did to me. That's not it. That's just, it's just a matter of leaving it to the Lord, letting him, vengeance is mine, he will repay, but you're being delivered, we're being delivered from his control over us. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. So an indication that a person is a child of God is they forgive other people who have sinned against them because they understand that they have been forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're, if, but if you do not forgive, then your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. It's just the saying, if you don't, do not forgive, and you harbor unforgiveness, and you harbor bitterness, it's an indication that you've not tasted and seen the kindness of God in saving you. Repent. 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 Which kind of leads to the next. We got maybe one. This is actually the last. The last. No, there's one more one. Unless you text me this week and say, "Oh, we text each other." Oh, I see other ways that God will hit his murder in the heart. And um, you could say, "Well, that's something I struggled with a long, long time ago." Or you could say, "That's something I've seen other people struggle with." If you don't want to say, "Then I struggle with this right now." All right. If there's a brother or sister in Christ, is there a brother or sister in Christ with whom we need to be reconciled? Some of the worst, I don't want to overstand it. Paul said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Is Alexander the coppersmith a brother? brother? I don't think so. I don't think so. So that's not a good illustration. But some of the worst, some of, sometimes we've been sinned against by a brother or sister in Christ, or by a so-called brother and sister in Christ. The point here is if we have a brother or sister in Christ, but we are harboring unforgiveness with our bitterness too, we need to go and be reconciled with them, even before it's kind of too late now. 
even before we partake, it shows the seriousness of it here, even before you partake of the Lord's table. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the, your offering at the altar, and therefore remember that something, remember your brother has something against you, leave your altar, leave your offering, leave your act of worship, leave your giving, leave whatever it is you're doing, and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and present your offering. This is in the area of worship. True worship, to really truly worship. You can't really truly worship fully if there's unreconcilable differences in our heart towards someone. I got a quote here from John MacArthur in one second that just nails it. Okay? Here it comes. I really like this. John MacArthur Jr. wrote, True worship, true worship, is not enhanced by better music, Although it probably can be. I'm not going to take away from it. Let me just read the quote, okay? True worship is not enhanced by better music, better prayers, better architecture, or even better preaching. True worship is enhanced by better relationships between those who worship. Leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. God says even interrupt your worship. The matter is so vital Go put it right. You cannot be right with God until you put yourself right with man. Go be reconciled to your brother. Ask for forgiveness. Acknowledge what you did, have done is wrong. I remember, I'll just tell this illustration. Probably was 1983. Probably was the summer of 1983. Maybe 84, but I think it was 83. It was soon after the Lord had saved me. And we all did bad stuff when we weren't saved. But just in that summer of 83, with the guys that I was hanging around with, and with the softball team that I was playing on, and I won't go into the details. A lot of stuff happened. And um, I acted like an unsaved man. I was an unsaved man. I acted like a total fool at this particular event. Uh, it was a softball game. I won't go into all the details. And I remember going, to, I had to. This isn't, to, this is just an illustration, it's not meant to pump up anything, but I had to go to a couple of the people that I really seriously offended and sinned against and told them, you know what? I am now a Christian. I am now a child of God. The Lord Jesus Christ has saved me. And I used it as a witness and testimony to these two guys I went to high school with, both of them, and said, what I did that particular night and what I did throughout all those events I did as an unsaved man and I was wrong and I, I need to ask you to forgive me for what I had done. And again, I don't know what else I said, but I used it as a testimony also of, uh, of being saved and how the Lord had saved me. And they, didn't, they just received it. They didn't ask me any other questions after that. Sometimes we have to do that. And sometimes we should do that. And I got to do that even more now than I did as a you know one month old, two month old, three month old, four month old Christian, we do we have to do it more now when we sin and we fed someone. Oh, there was one more. Really quick, God prohibits murder in the heart. Though this is probably more toward murder with the hand, but I won't read it. I'll just I won't read the verses, but I'll just say God places value on the sanctity of human life, all of life, bound to cover abortion. That would cover euthanasia, right? Mercy killing, all that. Psalm 139, 13 through 16. The value that God places on the sanctity of human life. Okay. God prohibits murder. In the prohibition, we got the command not to murder. The letter of the law, he prohibits murder in the heart. The spirit of the Lord, the law, he prohibits murder in the, with the hand, rather, the, the letter of the law with the hand. The spirit of the law, murder in the heart. How is God inviting me to respond to this prohibition against committing murder in the heart? As we close with a couple of other verses. I don't have to avoid the temptation to just keep preaching. I want to just close. John 8, 44 through 47 says, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning in hope and not holding to the truth. There's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. 
Yet because I tell you the truth, you don't believe in me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? This is Jesus speaking. If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God, here's what God says. Here's a danger, please. Here's a danger verse right here. A danger verse right here to the unsaved, unregenerate person. A danger verse right here to the not yet believer. A danger verse to the person right here, sitting here, watching this, listening to this, who's unsaved. A danger verse. I can't scream it. I can't say it loud enough. And unless God touches your heart, you're just going to reject it and go away in the hardness of your heart and in your unrepentant sin. It says the reason you don't hear is that you don't belong to God. Can you hear even a slight bit of this? Unsaved person, can you hear even a little bit of it? How you've murdered, how you've been angry, how you've been just keep going and, and you need Christ to save you. Can you hear even a little bit of it, enough to repent? Just enough to repent. That's all. We're not saying get it all right. We're not saying be perfect. We're not, but just enough to come to the cross of Jesus Christ today. Unnail, kneel down underneath this cross and say, God, save me. God, I repent. God, help me. I'm a murderer. I'm an adulterer. I'm all these other things. I'm, I need you to save me. Can you hear that? Can you hear that warning? Just a little bit. Just enough. Jesus said, I've come to have life and have it abundantly. That's what he offers to the unsaved person. Have you received that eternal life that Jesus Christ provides? John chapter 10, verse 18 says, By his sheep, he says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Deuteronomy, you want to hear the gospel in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 says, this day I call heaven and earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to his voice and hold fast to him. We'll help you with that part of it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Holding fast to Him will help you with that part. The church will help you with that part. But right now, will you just choose life? Even the death penalty. Talk about murder, right? Even the death penalty in comparison to the second death, which is reserved for the unsaved, pales in comparison. Revelation 20, verse 14 says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Can you hear me? Can you hear me just a little bit? Revelation 21, 8 says, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic, arts, and idolaters, and all liars. Their place will be the fire of lake, of burning fire. This is the second death. The second death pales in comparison. I mean, the, just even the death penalty pales in comparison to the death penalty that's on the life of a person who's a murderer and all these other things. And a liar, I mean, why do people lie? To protect themselves and to protect their skin. And they're trying to protect their skin in this life. Meanwhile, their soul is going to be damned to hell. You shall not murder. Quote for the week, please. Edward P. Clowney wrote, As with other commandments, Jesus transforms this one by more than his condemnation of murderers. He provides the very life that can rescue us from our murderous selves. That's my greatest need today. Even saved is to be delivered from my murderous self. He brings the life of a new creation in himself. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And God's word says, you shall not commit murder.
So thank you, Lord. Thank you for the truth of the scripture. Thank you, Lord, how you deepen it, Lord. Thank you, Lord, how you change and transform us, Lord, and are presently delivering those who are yours from our murderous self. Help us to see those areas, Lord, where we need to repent. And Lord, save anyone today, Lord, who can hear of their need for Christ to be saved. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I have to